Welcome back to the Singapore FinTech Festival 2020 Green Shoots series. So, of course, everybody, in just a bit, we will be proceeding on with a panel discussion, and they will be touching on the topic of challenger banking skill versus profitability. Our moderator for this session is Hock Lai from Singapore FinTech Association, and the panelists include Anish Achutan, co-founder and CEO Bank Open, Kohn Ra Jonka, Time Bank, Kevin Lum, UOB, and Salim, Big Pay. Let's welcome all of them. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you are. Welcome to the session, Challenger Banking, Skill versus Profitability. My name is uh, Hock Lai. I'm your moderator for the day. Uh, 23 years back, uh, Bill Gates once said in 1997, people need banking services. We don't need banks anymore. 23 years later now, there are more than 250 digital challenger banks all over the world. And that's a growth of 200% since 2015, over the last five years. So before we start, perhaps I would like to get the panelists today to give a quick introduction about their organization. Let's start with Kevin. Hi, my name is Kevin Lam and I'm from the UB Group. Um, tomorrow, Digital Bank is uh, essentially a uh, ASEAN-based digital bank, and UB will build this digital bank for the major markets of uh, ASEAN, including Thailand, Indonesia, and we soon plan for the other markets like Vietnam and the rest. So uh, we're very excited to be part of this uh, growing and bustling part of the world with a lot of financial innovation, and uh, UB is right in the thick of it. Salim? Yeah, sure. I'm with a big pay as a challenger bank model in Southeast Asia. Uh, we're also live in Malaysia and Singapore, and we're operating on uh, unbundled licenses, so e-money, remittances, I was at lending as well in, in those markets, and we plan to expand across the rest of Southeast Asia. Next, uh, we get uh, Anish. Founder and CEO at uh, open is an SME focused uh, uh, digital banking. Uh, open helps small businesses automate their uh, business finances using a business checking account. We have uh, 50,000 small businesses in India and we process uh, close to 23 billion US dollars in analyzed transactions. Kun? Hello, everyone. Uh, at time, we launched our first bank in South Africa in February last year. Uh, there we hold a universal commercial banking license and we focus on consumers, underserved consumers and small business. Uh, we now, 20 months in, we have about two and a half million customers of which 55% are active on a 30-day on a rolling basis. And we're preparing to take our model to country two, which will be the Philippines. Okay, my first question is for Kuhn. Uh, as the newcomer, in the South African uh, banking scene, uh, in fact, the first after 20 years to get the banking license in South Africa. How are you seeing uh, banking behavior changing uh, over at uh, South Africa? Hoklai, it's interesting. We're certainly seeing a, a big acceleration towards digital. As an example, from uh, when we went into lockdown in South Africa in March, We've more than doubled our customer base, more than doubled our payments on our platform. We've trebled balances and we've quadrupled uh, value added services on the platform. And that's in an economy that shrunk by 7% and most of the banks have shrunk in this time. So we clearly see this move towards digital. At the same time, there's still a lot of action in the physical world. Uh, as an example, we have over 800 kiosks where we onboard customers inside retail stores. And 85% of our two and a half million customers have still come to us through that channel inside retail stores. And uh, we have cash in and cash out transactions, deposits and withdrawals at toll points. And we still see that transaction at our 14,000 participating uh, cash registers as one of our customers' favorite transactions. So a move towards digital, but there's still a lot uh, waiting for us in the physical world. Okay, next, uh, Anish, uh, you positioned uh, open uh, financial technologies as a banking as a service uh, operator. So how important is uh, regulations to BAS 
players like you? Yeah. Okay, I believe uh, uh, regulation is very important for our industry. So currently, uh, we are not directly regulated. We are indirectly regulated through the partner banks. I believe once the regulation steps in, this will actually give us more opportunities to build new products or innovation or work more closely on certain financial products right now, which we are not uh, currently have access to. And the good part is that uh, the Indian regulator have been very proactive. Uh, they launched the uh, payment bank license four years back. They are actually now coming out with a sandbox for uh, open banking. So it's moving towards a positive way and uh, uh, it's very important for players like this. Okay, uh, Salim, uh, with COVID-19, uh, incidentally, uh, payments is one of the sub sectors uh, within FinTech that's doing extremely well. In fact, uh, payments is the sector that received the most funding in 2020 for Southeast Asia. Why is that so? And then uh, how does that uh, shape the development of uh, banking moving forward? For sure. I, I think when you look at Southeast Asia and you're looking at payments, <clears throat> you know, payments is very much hygiene, right? It's, it's the baseline that you get people using your product, using your service, getting onto your platform because it's the, the highest interaction that people usually have when it comes to financial services. And I think when you talk about, when you talk about investment coming in and, and, and more players coming in, Southeast Asia has a lot of headroom. You know, there is a long way to go. I mean, you can look at Singapore and it is evolved. But if you look at the rest of Southeast Asia, where you know, a lot of people are operating, there is a long way to go. And, that's, and then you can even further pass that out between urban and rural. And because of that headroom, and because of that opportunity that I think a lot of people are seeing and, uh, as was a, a long-term play. So creating that foundation for then the distribution of like, you know, revenue or creative products and services like loans or remittances or wealth products or savings, et cetera. Okay, Kevin. Why did uh, UOB started this uh, Tomorrow Bank and how do you compete in markets like uh, Thailand and Indonesia which you have launched? So I like that there are two parts to your question, right? Why Tomorrow Digital Bank? Tomorrow Digital Bank by UOB is part of a two-pronged strategy to attack and to defend. Attack in the markets like Thailand, Indonesia and the larger ASEAN markets where we are a smaller bank that we have the opportunity to be a challenger to the big local incumbent banks. Defend in our major markets like Singapore and Malaysia, where we are the incumbent, and where we take lessons and we build infrastructure into a common kitchen infrastructure and we share with our major markets, right, so that they'll be in better position to defend against the disruption that's coming. And how do we compete? Well, tomorrow competes on engagement. We have a unique engagement model. We call it ATGIE. Right, acquire, transact, generate data, gather insights, and then engage. And then we go back that cycle again. So that's basically how we compete. And then, uh, I mean, again, how, how, what are the next steps for Tomorrow Bank? Well, recently we have uh, launched in Indonesia. Uh, That's our second market after Thailand. And we are ready in the phase we call Tomorrow 2.0. We are going to focus on scale and commercialization. Right now, working with partners as well as digital credit is one of the key focuses of uh, Tomorrow Digital Bank. Hmm. Salim, uh, what's your take on skill and profitability, in particular in Southeast Asia, which is pretty fragmented uh, with complex regulatory environment? Yeah, I mean... Look, operating in Southeast Asia is not like Europe. You don't have access to, you know, 500 million people with one license. I, th I think, you know, it comes down to a few points. You're, but it's not only just about licenses, right? I think when it comes to scale, it comes down to cost as well. We see the function of prof profitability. But Southeast Asia has unique licenses. You've got unique regulations. You've got unique, you know, addressable markets and operating models. And so scale and profitability means very different things in very different markets, in, in all of the markets. I think that when it comes out to you know, how you launch you know, products in a particular market, um, you have to be very intentional you know, about you know, who are you going for, how do you manage that acquisition, how do you manage and how do you look at lifetime value? You know, so what is that strategy in terms of getting to profitability? Payments, you know, but based on you know, the earlier point, is that payments might be hygiene, but you need to quickly move away from that because capital is no longer moving for growth, but it's moving for you know, creating sustainable business models. And I think 
not only are is capital looking at that you know look, looking at that kind of uh, equation differently, but so are regulators. Regulators want sustainable business models. Um, so I think for us, you know, at Big Pay, we, we take a very unique approach to it, and we look at two things. You know, our, who are our, who is our customer that's going to give us the LTV that we need, uh, the life, you know, the value that we need across their lifetime. Um, how are we going to acquire them? And, and it means a couple of things. It means being really intentional about it. You know, are we going after the right people? Constantly asking ourselves these questions. You know, and, and then being really religious about what products that we're offering. You know, is this product going to suit the market that we have and the base mm -hmm. that we have? And that comes back to your, to your point, Kevin, on, on, on engagement and you know, making sure that you can actually generate that engagement over the long term. Mm -hmm. But there should be a way to measure the engagement. First, what do you think so, Hawaii? Yeah, I mean, just now we talk about uh, how to measure your customer segments. How do you measure uh, you are successful and which are the customer segments likely to deliver the yeah. profit that you want? Perhaps, because uh, our, Kevin, our, you can Our topic is about path to profitability, right? So, um, a lot of people talk about engagement, but I guess um, something we should, we should all maybe discuss a little bit. What is the path to profitability? Hmm. How do we convert engagement to profitable uh, banks and profitable PLs. Sure, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, like, it's great to say that you have engagement in payments, but fundamentally, you want engagement in loans. I mean, fintech is fintech, but ultimately, it comes down to how you manage your risk and, and how, how you manage your net interest margin. I mean, this, these fundamental things haven't changed. I agree with you, but you know, you, you have a banking license in all these markets, so you know, it's you're offering these loans, um, and at the same time, I think that you know, with new players come out, we'll all come out and offer it these. And get engagement in these, you know, kind of, uh, you know, unique revenue creative products as well. Uh, over yeah. the next Perhaps time. at this point, I would like to ask uh, Kuhn. Yeah, I mean, uh, what has worked so well so far for you, and how is time balancing skill and profitability? Because according to the uh, report, Dig Digital Challenger Bank, uh, is uh, issued by the Singapore FinTech Association and Boston Consulting Group last month. The profitable digital banks are those that uh, has a big uh, ecosystem, uh, big customer base, and they are very much into uh, credit products, which gives a higher profit margin. Yeah, what's the, your take on this? Yes, I, th I think, uh, um, Oglai, a lot of what Salim said uh, sort of rung true with me. Um, the, the challenge of our industry is, um, is that we have no choice on the scale thing. Digital banking, by its definition, is a scale game. And it means that, um, uh, you know, if you want a meaningful part of the, of the profit pool in any market, you have to drive scale. So there's no question on that. Uh, if I look back at our first 18 months, uh, in hindsight, I would have focused on uh, profitability earlier on in the journey. Um, I would have focused on sort of cross-selling earlier on in the journey. And uh, if there's anything I say to my team is, Try to think more like an e-commerce player and a bit less like a bank. Think about what are those uh, um, products that will give you the two really the two things you're looking after, uh, looking for. And the one is a high engagement on the platform, and the second is a propensity to spend on the platform. Uh, lending has been a bit of a, a double-edged sword for us, and that is really because of the capital intensity of lending and the extent to which under new accounting rules like IFRS 9, growing a lending book eats capital. So we certainly leaning a little bit away from the high capital intense uh, products towards high frequency lending products and also value added services, selling things off the platform um, uh, making it interesting for people to buy things on the platform uh, and to engage on a more ongoing basis. Yeah, perhaps now it's time to hear from, from the other player that focus on the SME market. Perhaps, uh, Anish, what are your plans, if any, in the ASEAN since you currently operate in the India? And uh, how is the SME digital bank different from a retail one when it comes to scaling and profitability? Okay. So uh, currently we are focused on India market because India itself is a large market of its own with uh, 51 million uh, MSMEs. So at least for the next two years, our focus is on the India market. Now uh, to your second question on how are we different from a retail bank? Uh, what we offer is like a business current account with a lot of tools to help the small businesses automate their business finance because that is one area they are really struggling with. And especially in a market like in India, unless you provide substantial value, uh, the business owners don't shift their 
checking account or a business current account. So what we have done is like we have built like tools like invoicing, account payable receivable automation, built-in payment gateway, and ultimately uh, helping this business owners to get back their time. So that has been working for us. And we've been working on a freemium SaaS model where 80% of the services are free. Of course, there are like certain pay-per-use services, but the rest of the uh, services, like some of the our expense management or account payables or our accounting, that comes on a small monthly fee. So that's the business model uh, which we're working on. Okay, uh, last Friday, uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore just issued four digital banking licenses, for, two for full digital bank and the other two for uh, digital wholesale banking. So now the whole Southeast Asia is a buzz with uh, digital banking. I think uh, Malaysia next year, they are going to issue their five uh, digital banking licenses. Philippines just uh, a week or two ago announced their digital banking regulatory framework. It seems like uh, Asia Pacific is quite unique as in like uh, they look at uh, uh, launching dedicated uh, digital banking uh, framework. So I would like to ask four of you, right, uh, what's your take on this and is this a boon or pain to the incumbent ba banks? Perhaps I would like to start with uh, Kevin. Obviously. No, I think it's both a boon and a bane. Uh, whether it's a boon or a bane for the incumbents really depends on how the incumbents uh, respond to the challenges there. For us at UOB, we're reminded not to be complacent and I can assure you we are not complacent. And I know many of my colleagues, uh, not just in uh, Singapore, but also where I was uh, based in Indonesia and Malaysia previously, many of the incumbent banks the large ones, the mid-sized ones, and even the smaller sized ones, they're all gearing up. So back to the point, the very first question, Hoklai, that you asked me, what's the role of tomorrow? Tomorrow, if I've said attack and defend, is essentially like a weapon for UOB, right? So we're taking the competition very seriously. And uh, when we go into competition, right, we have to be prepared to give as good as we take. So like a boxer going to a ring, be ready. That sounds very similar to the strategy of uh, DBS. That's how they position their Digibank in, in India also as a newcomer in the Indian market. Uh, they use the digital bank to penetrate the market. Perhaps, uh, Salim, what's your take on this? Digital banking is not just about a license, right? Like, I mean, don't get me wrong. Yeah, sure. It increases you. It makes it much more efficient for your capital. When you have scale, you make more money. And that is important. I'm not, not taking away from that. And, and it's... We're seeing some really innovative regulation, I think, coming out from in Singapore and, and in Malaysia and also the Philippines and also other markets that I'm sure that are going to be you know, coming out. But when it comes to boon or, you know, you know, boom or bane for existing banks, the banks, yes, you have tomorrow, but yes, you have DBS. But fundamentally, it's not just about an API or digital layer that you build on top. You need, you need to, it's about the culture of how you're launching your products in your bank. Can you really go after the customer, offer products quickly and, and simply, um, that can take market share? Can you really think outside the box and not like a bank? Can you approach risk differently? So I think that, yes, I look at the licenses, you know, as a very much as I would, as an efficiency, as a question of efficiency. You know, can you, how, at what point does it make sense to take those, you know, additional operating costs and, you know, as a make more margin on the products that you're offering? Um, but I think ultimately digital banking and successful digital banks, whether they be incumbents or new players like us, will very much come down to just more than just the license. Um, but at least, at least companies you know, like yourselves that have, have products and services out there, some of them are asleep at the wheel. So uh, let's, let's see what so happens. So is there any plans for big pay to apply for the digital banking license in Malaysia since you are based out in Malaysia? Yeah, example? look, I mean, for us right now, we have, you know, we've, we've, you know, we work with Visa and MasterCard. We, we have our you know, debit-esque products riding on prepaid rails, on e-money. We have a remittance. We have also lending licenses that just got announced a couple of weeks ago in Malaysia. And you know, similarly, e-money and remittance in, in Singapore. Yes, we will go for it. But again, we view it very much as efficiency of capital and how we launch our lending products in, in Malaysia. We made no secret that we're going to go after. And, and we're, we're very excited about the, the Malaysian banking licenses that are, that are being released. What about Kuhn? What makes you uh, apply for the G, uh, banking license in South Africa? Um, you know, we think that, that we're just at the start of a major revolution that's going to take place. And financial services is only one part of that revolution to, towards a more, more digital world. 
Uh, and so we see we see a massive disruption opportunity, particularly on the on the cost side. To give you a sense, um, uh, the, the the most cost effective bank in South Africa of the big banks are the scale banks. Uh, their cost base at scale is probably somewhere between five and seven times our cost base to provide the same product complexity to the same size customer base. Uh, and so, so, so I think the game we, we we're saying the game is on. I think there's there's three, five, seven years in which this uh, industry will be reshaped. Uh, but I think my message to to new players and incumbents. Be ready to change to change fast and be ready for the unexpected because customers are going to be voting with their with their eyeballs and their fingers and their feet, and they're going to be voting in directions that I don't think the incumbents uh, and even some of the new players who think that they already know what's going to happen. Uh, I think uh, things are happening in a direction that people don't see coming. Yeah, about Anish. Yeah, so uh, I agree with uh, Salim. It's more about the culture, whether it's an incumbent or a new bank with a license. Uh, you know, a while back, a year back, I was actually talking to one of the, uh, you know, CEO of one of the subsidiaries of an existing incumbent bank, and he says that okay, we had actually got our employees wearing T-shirts, sitting out of a co-working space. But when it comes to the uh, the, uh, the compliance guy or the legal guy, it's the same old guy, and that's the biggest bottleneck. So uh, I think it's a good opportunity for incumbents to, uh, you know, look back and probably the ones which will succeed, uh, uh, it's also have an opportunity for some of the smaller ones or even the larger ones to succeed if they are able to, you know, uh, think in the right direction in terms of like, you know, the customer experiences and compete with the uh, new players. And uh, again, as Salim said, it's not really easy to, I mean, getting, getting a banking license is tough and once you have achieved it, it's, again, it's like, it's not that easy to, you know, you have to look at a lot, lot of things in terms of regulations and things like that. So it's, it's uh, so I do believe that it's actually going to be, it depends on, uh, you know, uh, how you actually look at it, whether you are an incumbent or, a, you know, a digital only bank. Hong is it okay I, I respond? Because I yes. guess the, the, sure. the three other panelists are all the challenger, the new banks, right? I'm part of the, the incumbent banks, right? I, let, let me put across, I think, for the path to profitability, we did some research, right? I offer four four major points for consideration. First, we studied over 200 digital banks around the world, and we're tracking how they're doing. The ones that are now found a way or on their way to a path to profitability have invariably operated in a large market that have some inefficiencies that they have found that they can address. Second, to Kun's point, there is a quantum leap in cost savings that they're able to deliver the same products and services at a fraction of the cost of what it was before. Perhaps no branches is one of them. Perhaps digital, uh, what you call core banking as a, as a service is one of them. The third element, uh, Kun's point was earlier about lending, right? So, I mean, banking is no secret, right? It's about taking the deposit on one side and making loans on the other side. So you make the net interest margin. But lending, remember, I think uh, Salim and, and, and Anish all, it is a risky business. So you have to be able to live through a cycle. It's not just about customer acquisition. Sorry, I, I beg to defer on some of the points that were said earlier. You have to be mindful that as a bank or some sort of financial institution that's supposed to last, the first responsibility is to the depositors. You take public money and you must be there when the money is ready to be taken out by them anytime. We are running a leverage system, right? If you understand banking, demystify all of this, right? Couldn't talk about 570. I think it probably might come earlier. A banking system, essentially, there are 10 cups, so to speak, right? But there's only two covers. At any point in time, if any customer, all customers come back and says, I want my deposit at the same time, you call that a bank run, and the system collapses. So it's all a system that's based on trust, right? Which, to my last point, right, I think uh, the regulation needs to be very conducive, which I think here now in Singapore and many parts of Southeast Asia, it's beginning to open up. Tomorrow, we see ourselves as a challenger bank. We go out to markets where we are small and we compete, but we are ever mindful that risk management, I, I read some of the, the incumbent statements, uh, uh, sorry, some of the challenges that won the um, awards, uh, the licenses in Singapore last week, and said that you know, they'll be particularly concerned about credit risk. They're particularly concerned about cyber risk. May I remind everybody, banking is not just about credit risk and cyber risk, right? If you are a bank, 
uh, there is both also our market and liquidity risk. That's essentially first what we have because we take deposits, right? And said we need to be accountable for deposits. There's what we call operational risk, which also includes reputational risk, legal risk, repu uh, what do you call uh, cyber risk is one of them, but also compliance and regulatory risk. As a CEO of uh, UB Indonesia, where I was for the past four years, every year I have to give account to the, to the regulator and they give us a rating. Just like you go to school every year, they give you a rating. And if your rating is below a certain level, because either what you do or what you don't do, right, you be sure that you will get very uh, serious telling off. And if you don't fix it and you don't uh, get that in order, then you'll be sure that you're not going to be around on an ongoing basis. So I think that um, boon or bane, it's certainly very exciting. I think this injection of competition is really waking up. If there's somebody asleep at the wheels, I think I assure you they've already woken up right now and they are not taking the challenge lightly. Yeah, Salim. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I don't think fintechs kind of come to the market, uh, you know, to your point, and, and ignore risk. I think risk is, you know, extremely important, and it's about taking a measured approach to risk. Banks, you know, are very risk averse and typically have been, which I think where fintechs found opportunity. Will there be convergence to some level? I think so. I agree. Over the long term, there will be, as you know, kind of as you see those, you know, kind of the scale kind of grow out. There will need to be, but. Very fundamentally, I think when it comes to culture and how culturally you approach risk, it's not about putting people at risk, you know, putting deposits or not having your responsibility to, to, to depositors. I think that, you know, it's about finding new ways to manage your risk in an efficient way, looking at different data points. All, all very good buzzwords, yeah. but the proof will be you have to collect. To me, I think digital banking, right? I, I, I gave an interview last week to the H magazine. I said funding before lending, right? If as a bank, you don't collect enough funding, right? You're not in the business. I think Kun made a lot of good points about ca risk capital. When you do lending, you need to set aside. You know, I mean, he's running a real bank right now. He understands it's very capital intensive, right? So compliance costs, right? Uh, regulatory costs. I think, uh, don't get me wrong. We are not, as I said, being defensive. We're not being complacent. The, the challenge is very welcome. Uh, we, we very much uh, look at this very positively. But I, I just want to just... Uh, for all the colleagues right in the in the room remember that uh, banking is a is a stewardship of uh, public's money and we need to be responsible sure but i just want to say that there are some and, and i'm sorry you know anish and Conan, just but on that point yes there are buzzwords but you've seen some fantastic models if you look at tinkoff you look at starling you look at other banks globally that we're have managed them, it. we're following them every week every, well they're a lot more month. efficient than the banks here and a lot of the incumbent banks i'll yeah. tell you that right now right if you look at the annual report so yeah. there is room to grow and there are there's definitely room to do things differently definitely well, yeah i would love to hear from kun on this point um, Look, Lai, it's, it's fascinating listening uh, to the two colleagues on stage because, it, for me, it illustrates the yin and yang of banking and the challenge for all of us so powerfully um, is how do you get that balance right? You know, there is this saying that we, we never balance as human beings. We're always in the process of balancing. And, and for all of us, this is going to be the challenge. Can we be mature? Can we, can we manage our risk in a way that is responsible to deposit takers and to our regulators and, and help society along, play our role in society? At the same time, can we be creative uh, and, and, and courageous and, and do the things that no one else have had the, uh, the challenge to, uh, or have had the courage to do? Uh, and, and, the, and there's no simple answer to this. This is going to be... This is going to be the challenge for all of us, but the people who get it right, the people who get this balance right between, between managing risk, being sustainable and being creative are the people who are going to, to play the, the, the winning roles in transforming our economies. Yeah. Anish, you are a new bank. How would you respond to Kevin's uh, point? Yeah, so... Uh... I completely uh, agree with Kevin that uh, uh, it's been for over the decades, basically, banks know how to uh, really manage the customer funds and take care of the compliances and the risk. But when it comes to the customer experiences and when it comes to like, you know, uh, you know, as adapting to the new changes in the market, that's where I do believe that, OK, we need to have new players or new licenses. And I also agree with uh, uh, Conrad that we, we can have a 
the ones who succeed will be the ones who is able to balance between the risk and the compliances on one side and on the other side taking care of the user, user experiences and the innovation. Yeah, unfortunately due to time limit, uh, I'm not able to ask a further question. So let me quickly sum summarize. Uh, definitely banking is not simple. And having said that, while there are more and more digital challenger, ba challenger bank coming to the market, the incumbents are not resting, right? Uh, like the likes of uh, UOB, they are in fact using digital challenger bank as a model to penetrate new markets. So with that, uh, let us uh, thank our esteemed uh, panelists for their very insightful sharing. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. For thank, thank, you. Thank, you. Uh, thank you. With that, uh, thanks for uh, watching this uh, panel. Have a nice day.